All right, we're going to finish up chapter two on data models, going over why certain models were used and what they're generally like. But first, go ahead and pause the video, and I believe it is Molly's turn to pray. Thank you, Molly. Now we'll continue here with our models. Remember the objectives of this chapter were to do the data, uh, learn what data modeling is. It's a more abstract view of the database, how we use it and why they're important because we figure out the business rules. Think of business rules as being what the application needs to do. That's the business rules. That's the business of the application. And most likely meeting some business need. It doesn't necessarily have to be for a business, but there is some kind of system that needs something to happen correctly. Those are the rules. There's going to be, and we're going to go over those, those major data models, how they sort of evolve. So over the years, since the 1960s, according to the table on table in table 2.1, these models have been evolving. Why they've evolved that way and understanding the reason for their abstraction, meaning it's not the exact code, it's more of a higher level view of things. That's what abstraction is. Sometimes it's confusing. Sometimes it's clarifying for people that don't need the details. They want to know what is the big picture. So level of abstraction means the one doing the code has a little further to go to actually write the code, but it's abstract enough for someone to get the picture of what it is doing and the general generalities. Abstractions are generalities of things and often uh, analogies of how things are working but not the real code. So we started looking at the models and I'm going to go through this quickly because we kind of talked about them a little bit already just to kind of get an idea in the, into the mind of the designers way back to the 1960s when computers were giant circuits and didn't do a whole lot, took a lot of power, but they were smart people and learned to use them and they developed the storage of files in a hierarchical way and if you're storing files and information in files and someone's very smart and knows what data they need and has, has organized data in certain ways in a hierarchical way which often your mind does you categorize things and then break down categories into subcategories that's hierarchical it's a natural way of thinking so that became a natural way of storing data and as they realize it's not always top-down parents to children in an upside down tree like a file system sometimes there's connections relationships between data going across relationships and so the network model was developed about the same time where data is in multiple places not simply uh, uh, access going from parents down but sort of connections between different uh, types of data. So it's not just the one-to-many, but many-to-many. -many. And in the book, they have these categorized together of the 1970s model. Now what came before these models was the lo more loosely defined file system. And that was way back in the 60s where they the, the system itself was changing, and so they couldn't establish a stable model because even computer systems weren't storing weren't storing data in the same way the next computer that came along or the next vendor had a whole different type of computer that was back in the days of vms and uh, deck and oracle starting out you are familiar with hierarchical because you've been using files the file system is a hierarchical method one way in Linux that gets around the file system child to parent is you can make symbolic links between a child to another child way across the system and you can 
overcome the climbing up out of a folder over to another child. You can do that in Windows too. You make shortcuts all over your desktop. There are direct links to children somewhere deep down in the file system that is still stored hierarchically. And we talked about XML as being a way of showing that relationship or that something that had that same hierarchical relationship. Very much like HTML. There's tags around start tag and an end tag and in between there. I don't know why I keep changing. I guess I better not move my mouse anymore. Tags around the data change how the uh, well children are contained in a outer parent. But you can have multiple children as long as you close the first child. And XML should be something you should be familiar with. Review that uh, when you come to data types. It's not going to be a huge topic. Now, the terms that you need to remember for a database in your con and a, a few concepts here. We'll be covering more. The schema is how the entire database is organized or viewed by the administrator. The subschema is a portion of the database. And we're going to see that when we see external models. The subschema would be the tables in the Northwind database that are specifically rated, related to uh, shipping. The subschema for shipping is all that shipping cares about. They don't care about the orders and the logging of customers. All they want to know is how do I get the product to the shipper? That would be a subschema. The language for manipulating the data. Remember the very standard, very common term, CRUD, create, read, update, delete. There's many languages that can do the CRUD, and that language is what's used with a database. That would be SQL commands contain both manipulation of the data, creating, reading, update, and deleting data, but there's also, especially in the create, the language in the create or the parameters to a create command, you could kind of think of that as the data definition language. Defined the, the components of your schema. We've seen that in the database relationship diagram. That's, in it. That's somewhat manipulating the schema, but it's more graphical. Remember, as you get more abstract, which the relational database was more abstract from the hierarchical, you begin approaching the point where you can specify what must be done without specifying how. And if you think about what we're doing in system analysis, that's a big part of system analysis. In the analysis side and the planning side, you are specifying what must be done. And then in the design and implementation, you start figuring out the details of how it's done. But the big picture is what must be done, the higher abstraction language. And SQL allows us to do that. Example of the schema and the uh, d data design, remember the terms that there are entities. Those are the names of our tables. The table specifies what entities are contained within that table. There's an agent entity. There's a customer entity. Inside those tables are columns, which are attributes of the records in that entity. Each record in the agent entity contains multiple attributes. Okay. Each record is an instance of that entity with those attributes. So a record is an instance. And we're looking at instance 502. Oh, the arrow somehow moved a little bit. Instance 502. And down there we have instance 10013 of a customer entity. Records are instances. Entities are the table names. And it's best, 
it's most it's common practice to use singular version for the tables you have an agent table of course it contains multiple instances of agents so you'd be tempted to to label the table agents plural but it's common practice to use the singular and you'll be happier axis and sql will be happier okay so the relational model then came after the hierarchical network model and this is where the revolution came in that you introduced uh, sim the entity relationship modeling and just putting those models together helped to describe the system and approach a more stable design or, or, or more quickly reach the stable design. So you've got automatic transition versus the standard transmission, an improvement. And you had this idea of a data manipulation in the language. Think of the SQL commands are those data manipulation constructs. And we had the tuples are those roles of multiple instances of entities. The attributes or the field names were the columns in the table. Standard terminology. And the RDMS, RDBMS, the Relational Database Management System, is the software that handled all that. Multiple companies that were dealing with relational database, DB2, Oracle, Microsoft SQL Server came in in the 70s, and MySQL came in at about the same time in the 70s, supporting this relational model. All right, so as time went by, we had more models. There's your relationships. An agent entity is related to the customer entity through the agent code relationship. The agent entity is related to the customer entity by way of the agent code. Notice the primary key is on one side. That's specifying the one side. And the many side is on the agent code referenced from inside the customer table, also known as the foreign key, because I'm referencing some other table for this code. One thing to remember when you're doing working with the database, the data type when you're designing tables and putting establishing the values in tables, the data type here must be exactly the same data type as it's defined in this table or the relationship will fail. Just makes sense. You can't refer have this be a num uh, a string containing characters and here it is a number. For, uh, primary keys have to be unique. They don't always have to be numbers. But whatever type of data it is here, it must be that same type of data here in the, to have that relationship at all possible. Now the ways that the users and designers interact with the table is your database application. Access, PHP my admin that you now have experience with, and we're going to get a little experience with in Schoology. I have made a little activity in the form of a certification test simulation, where you're going to be interacting with the database as though you were being certified with MS SQL, performing various tasks and proving your completion of that using that interface. The SQL Server Management Studio is the uh, user interface. Now, of course, you also design the end user interface. That's the forms in Access. And PHP or MyAdmin, that is more the designer side. The end user interface interacting with MySQL likely to be a scripting language. It's server-based scripting language usually because they're making SQL co command calls to a server pulling data back and there's a lot of interaction there 
most of the time I've seen the script interacting with databases is usually on the server in a web-based database interface. Remember the database can be com on a completely different system. In that database the engine is executing all the commands, storing data, creating data, reading data, back to a client, updating data that the client has updated, or deleting the CRUD. Remember, C-R-U-D. The model is representing that relationship. Again, this is all details of the relationship, the relational model that's been around since the 70s. So we're going to be spending our time on this, and basically the book is relationship model. We're just going to talk about those other models, but all these things are dealing with how the relationship model works. That diagram you've seen, even without knowing all the other details of the system, just manipulating that relationship diagram helped you understand how the Northwind database works. You could print that out, put that on your wall, and as you just gazed at that chart and traced how it's how the tables are related, you would probably not be too hot, bad at troubleshooting that database if you started seeing problems because immediately in your mind you would know oh there's where that data came from and if you make a change here here it's going to affect these other tables so they allow the representation of the database and remember that instance or entity occurrence I call them rows in access the types of relationship that's what we call connectivity it's the what kind of relationship is it? As we go into the details, we'll see that. For example, if I change the customer ID in one table, does it automatically get changed in all the children? If I'm doing a query, do I want to see only the data that has a matching customer ID, say an order, or a product that has a matching representative or latest customer or do I want to see all the all the uh, product information regardless of whether a customer has ordered it that's another thing dealing with the relationship type now in the diagramming of these types remember there's multiple kinds of look of notations and we'll be I'll be mainly using this one because I think this is uh, well it's part of the some of the software we use has this right there this is a little harder to see and diagram. This little few few too many shapes, uh, and it's kind of a pain to draw. This is a little easy to draw in the drawing tools we have. Visio probably can do any of those, uh, but we don't have Visio as available as it used to be. I've been using Lucid Chart. Pretty happy with that for making those kind of diagrams. And you can uh, use it, you can do it in PowerPoint too, have a little templates. Then the next model that came out, we're calling this the fourth generation, came about in the mid 1980s, the object oriented relationship model. And the examples of this given in the book were Versant, Objectivity DB, DB2, and Oracle 11G. Now the object model as I did some more reading out there about it. Knowing the object-oriented approach is I have objects that represent that hold my data. And I'm not only holding the data about a customer, but I'm also containing the operations that are performed on that customer. Uh, saving, changing, uh, performing the updated invoice with that customer. So it's a little more complex than the relational model, but I guess what it gives you as I was reading about it is it, well, the main thing I read about it was when you're using the object model and you have a program, the data is brought up in memory in arrays of the object. And generally, one advantage of object-oriented is they run faster because they're pulling all the data into objects in memory. Sounds to me could be kind of inefficient, but that's one advantage or one uh, attribute of the object-oriented database. 
In the table on 2.1, it mentions that the star schema support for data warehousing, web databases become common. So as the web and the programs to interact with websites became more complex or needed maybe a closer um, cache of the data, you could cache it in memory as a huge array of objects and perhaps uh, work better. And remember, the object-oriented view of the world makes perhaps some applications a little better to uh, visualize and to program a little different type of abstraction in the object-oriented world. So even though it's sort of a advance in some speed and complexity, relational was still around. And object-oriented, uh, I have not run across any. They say uh, DB2. I haven't used DB2 or Oracle 11G. I've been a MySQL uh, and Microsoft SQL guy uh, played a little bit with Postgres, which looks very much like SQL. The relational has stuck around. So remember with, with objects, you have classes of types of objects. So in your application, if we're describing an application and classes keep coming up of objects, you might say, you know, the way we're thinking about it in our design, if it's if the way we're thinking about it is object-oriented, maybe we'll better understand it and program it better if we use an object-oriented collection or uh, model for the data. And when you're doing object-oriented, the UML modeling language has a whole set of diagramming for object-oriented systems, and perhaps that would help the designers better understand the system and lend itself to object-oriented design of my database. That's up to the designers. So still have the rows and columns in uh, a normal database. And I took this from a article out there. Here is that mention of permanent persistence to object is common to object-oriented or object databases meaning they stay in memory rather than going back to disk, stay in fast access memory, so typically fast response. But because they're more complex and they're not as common, you don't have as many programmers available, and thus people can't afford or can't find the programmers for object-oriented databases. So there's the three models, kind of a view of it, Again, an abstraction of it, where we have entity relationship model, a similar class diagram in UML language, and it also works with objects. And with object representation, we have that invoice, and the customer and line are subclasses or objects within the invoice object. And I'm not sure what this diagram is represents exactly, but everything encapsulated in an object called an invoice. Here we have an invoice related to customer and line tables outside of the invoice table. And of course you could spend a lot of time comparing object-oriented. There again it's hard to find object developers. There's not that many databases supporting it with language, with language that support that. And SQL has become standard. Remember that came first and huge databases and a, a base of many applications. Why, le why learn something new if that's doing the job? Unless this fails miserably at some thing that object does, we're going to stick with what's been working. The extended model basically is attempting to support both the object-oriented features and some more complex data. Uh, as data gets more complex, uh, and there's the XML. Remember that's a sort of a hierarchical structure, but remember with XML I can store data. All I have to come up with is a tag for it, and I can store it without having a specific 
schema for my table. I can just throw data in. Oh, they've they've given that they've uh, they've commented. I put comment. Here's what they said. Slash comment for the end tag. Oh, here comes a measurement I made. Data tag. Enter the numbers for the measurement or for the numbers that we just read from the stock ticker. Close that tag. Oh, then image just came in. Save it as an image. Unstructured data coming in. And I can exchange it with anyone else because anyone can read XML. It's the become a standard format. Now, as we before we get to our other model, they bring up the idea of big data and why that all works. And I do have a, a link to the big data video. And I will give a link to that and maybe let you watch that as part of this. I'll let you choose if you want to watch the big data video. Now is not a bad time. I'm going to stop and find that and I'll post the link here. Oh, I see I did have the link there. I had I was too far ahead of myself. The next slide here has a big data video when we get to here, but let's see what we had before that. We have the reason for big data is We've got huge amounts of data being generated. Sensors, the Internet of Things, how many times you've opened your refrigerator or your toaster. You've got to be able to scale at reasonable cost. And lots of volume, lots of speed, and a quite a lot of different data. It's not all customer data. It's unpredictable data. Now, if you knew what the categories were, my first approach would be, well, you make a separate table for images and the data for images and the location and the time taken and who took it and where it's posted. But sometimes you don't know what's coming in. You have to handle all sorts of data. It can be very expensive if you're spending the time to make up a structure that keeps changing depending on changing amount of data, changing types of data and how much data. The OLAP tools, okay. OLAP, of course you must remember this, online analytical processing tools. That was mentioned somewhere in there. I hate acronyms sometimes. Online analytical processing tools need to process the data and if it's unstructured, how can you process unstructured data? How do you even interpret the data? That was a problem. Some of the big names, again, to be familiar with in an interview uh, would include these names. These aren't the only names. If you just look up big data, you'll find others. But Hadoop is big, and I think Amazon Web Services may provide something. Since we're at the about the 30-minute mark here, and this is about a 12 minute video. I'm going to stop here and let you watch this video. Just click on that link, it'll take you to that video. After that video is over, you can stop and take a look at the challenge there in the activities. I'm going to bring that up here on the screen. The in the assignments folder, towards the end here, a Microsoft SQL connection challenge. You're not going to be able to get it done today, so I think I'll change that due date. I'll, I'll move that due date forward because I think you're going to need a little more time. And on Monday, I am not going to do it all on Monday, so you better work on that. On Monday, I'll go over some of that. I'll record going through that. But get some of that done, or all of it done, and then we can review anything. And you can send me an email between now and Monday, and I can post some answers. So in that quiz, it's a certification test you have to connect to a MySQL, 
Microsoft SQL, not MySQL, Microsoft SQL Server. And I've given you little tasks to go along the way. They go in order, complete those tasks. So watch that video, come and start on that, and send me an email if you need any help, and I'll be catching your emails and giving you some help on the recorded video on Monday. So watch that video now, then when you're done, try that little certification test. All right, I'll stop recording now.